You guys can see this? Yes. Okay. So basically, I typically give something on PCNL, but Rich asked me to give you something on nef nephrolithiasis. I thought it'd probably be easiest for you guys uh, would be to simply focus on kind of how I prepared for the um, writtens and the SASPs and the um, and the orals, which is basically just looking at like any AUA updates you guys can get um, as well as the AUA guidelines. And I just pulled a bunch of the SASP questions and then you guys can just take turns um, answering the questions, all right? So it's, it will be hard to do maybe in this format because everyone's in Zoom. So just kind of um, maybe start from top down with regards to seniority when the questions come up. And then there will be repeats, so we'll just power through. And then um, I can share this with you guys if you want. Um, just let me know, and I'll give it to, to, to one of you. Does that sound reasonable? Thanks. Yes, that sounds reasonable, Tim. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. So first is just AUA updates. And so there's one AUA update that goes over the um, kind of the managed medical, medical and surgical management kidney stones, and it has this very – easy schematic which is why kidney stones are kind of straightforward and essentially if something someone's symptomatic and the stone's bigger than two centimeters you should send them for pcnl with the exception of someone who is you know on blood thinners or can't come off blood thinners or high bleeding risk and those patients should have stage ureteroscopy and if a patient has a stone less than two centimeters then you kind of put them in i classify as either a small stone or a medium-sized stone the medium-sized stone, um, and they're in the lower pole, and you think it will be an easy perk, then you can err towards the side of doing a PCNL. If it's non-lower pole, and it's you know up to about a centimeter and a half, and then you can lean towards doing uteroscopy. Um, as well, really should be reserved for stones that have low Hounsfield units um, and, and lower stones. And I know as well is used here a lot, where I trained, no one did as well because the failure rate was so high. So people just thought, why not just bring it to the, to the um, uh, operating room and do ureteroscopy. Now, like the time that one is spent dealing with a stent or kind of the quality of life that one's, one has after ureteroscopy can be argued as being longer and worse than as well, but you're more likely to be stone free. So if you have capabilities to do as well, then I think it's reasonable to ask if they are willing to have a procedure that has about a 30% failure rate, then that, that makes sense. And then if the uh, stone's less than a centimeter, then um, basically, again, looking at lower pole or non-lower pole um, and choosing as well, you were asking me off of that. Any questions for this? Yeah, quick question. Um, where is the, uh the role for an anatrophic nephrolithotomy in today's day? I can't imagine, I don't ever seeing that being done now in today's world. Like would it be a, like a, somebody with larger than a two centimeter stone burden that um, you can't get any safe renal access or something like that? Or, I don't know. Um, Maybe. I mean, I think the surgeons who can do those now are few and far between. So I think you would just right. do like, you know, you'll see these people have three, four tubes in with a PCNL. So, and that's such a morbid surgery. Um, I, I just don't see a real role for it. I guess from a board perspective, you could present that as an option, but uh, I wouldn't really go down that road. You could say included in the treatment options for like a huge stag and a healthy person with a normal contralateral kidney. Yeah, you could maybe make that argument, but um, most people wouldn't do those. Any other questions? Tim, for, I see that pediatric in this algorithm almost is uh, diverted towards as well for non-lower pole uh, stones. Do you see a lot of uh, non-lower pole uh, pediatric stones with uh, treated with as wells or with I don't see peds patients, so you'd have to ask um, 
the peds guys i think P the, the advantage of doing as well with kids is you don't have to stent them so that's why there may be more preference to do that and then you know obvious contraindications to <clears throat> to um as well or what How about is woman that Question? Is that a question? It's a question, yeah. Um, pregnancy? Okay. Anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is huge, yeah. <laughs> pregnancy, yeah. And yeah then, uh, any, anything that involves like the, like some kind of pancre like pancreatic pathology? Like what? Ah. Uh, I don't know, pancreatitis. I've never heard of that. Is there, isn't there like a theoretical risk for pancreatic injury for a left-sided as well? Probably. No, I've, I've not run into questions regarding that and I'm not aware of that, but that makes sense because the upper pole of the left kidney oftentimes is sitting right next to the pancreas. So yeah, that would be another. The big thing is anticoagulation. Because of the risk, really, for as well as getting a, um, you know, subcapsular hematoma. All right. Um, and then I'll just I won't go over this. You can just look at this on your slides. And these are this the different scopes, and you can see the size of the French that you can put things through the scope, as well as the field of view, um, and then the level of flexion and deflection. Um, and then this is just some medical, this is more just going over the medical and genetic conditions associated with recurrent stone formation, you know, a whole list of them, um, you know, uh, hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, uh, gout, diabetes, RTA, obesity, metabolic syndrome, sarcoidosis, recurrent UTIs, any GI issues, and then there's some ge genetic predispositions as well that will um, predispose you to kidney stones. Um, if you look at the dietary modifications to correct these abnormalities, most of this makes sense. Um, and this is based off of the 24 hour urine. So in your clinics, when you run clinic, you can use the LithoLink um, to, to help you guide the therapy. And the nice thing about LithoLink as well is it kind of gives you its recommendation, which almost correlates exactly with what we see here. So obviously low volume, you want to increase the volume, high sodium, decrease the amount of sodium you have, high calcium, reduce sodium intake, normal calcium intake. So patients will come in saying that they've been told that they can't eat calcium. Um, that's like an old wives tale. That's not true. It's important to have them take the, the recommended daily allowance. Um, high oxalate, obviously decrease the amount of um, foods that have oxalate in them. Um, Aaron, what are some foods that have high oxalate in them? I know spinach is like the classic one. Um, like uh, nuts as well. Yeah. What about what drinks? I'm not sure what drinks. So black tea is a big culprit. So spinach, black tea, um, uh, nuts, chocolate, all those things predispose you to. Uh, oxalate stones, higher acid, um, decreased amount of animal protein, and um, you know all all meats the same. So fish is just as bad as chicken is just as bad as as pork or um, beef. Then low citrate, increase the intake of fruits and vegetables, limit amount of animal protein. Um, par parways, what what yes. what drink can increase citrate? Um, sodas. No. Uh, um, <laughs> Let's say you decide to go to the gym and work out a lot. So oh, sports yeah. drinks like yeah, Gatorade, drinks, like that, yeah. have a lot of citrate in them. Right, right, right. Um, but they also have a, a fair amount of sugar, so it's like a, 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 a kind of hit one second. Yeah. Come in. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. You too. Um, what else were we talking? Low citrate and 
the other thing you can do is just increase the amount of uh, lemon juice. And uh, like when you're having patients hydrate, have them drink lemon juice um, with their water or lemonade or orange juice, things like that. And then cysteine urea, decrease the amount of uh, sodium uh, in general for a day. The, the problem is, is, well, not the problem, but the fact is, is when you see patients with kidney stones, oftentimes most of them don't want to do a 24 hour urinalysis because it's, you have to walk around collecting your urine for 24 hours and no one wants to do that. Maybe you can do it more in the COVID times, but previously you couldn't do that. So the, um, I generally will give my stone recommendations if I don't want, know what the stone is. I'll make the presumption that it's going to be a calcium oxalate stone because that's the most common. And I'll just advise them to you know, drink lots of fluid, more than two liters a day. Um, when they're drinking the fluid, make sure they're avoiding the uh, fluids such as um, uh, tea uh, or soda. Um, do you, Rand, do you remember that guy you put the super pubic tube in when it, when we pulled his stent and he, and he went in retention? Uh, yeah, the one I did in clinic. Yeah, so this guy had like huge bilateral kidney stones and someone had told him to hydrate himself and he'd been drinking like two to three liters of black tea every day. So that just like made his situation even worse. So you got to educate them on what to drink and then also um, avoid and eat in moderation foods that have a lot of oxalate, like what um, Aaron had spoken about. And then just eat a heart healthy diet with not too much um, animal protein. Um, this you guys can just peruse at your own leisure. It just, just kind of goes over um, drugs that you can use when you're looking at specific type of stones and why you're getting those stones. So calcium stones, um, and then uric acid stones, cysteine stones, and struvite stones, okay? And then also, I like it because you could just, it'll give you how you need to monitor it, right? So with like thiazides, you need to follow them with uh, BMPs, um, potassium citrate, you need to check the potassium, obviously, creatinine, alpurinol, you need to check for liver enzymes. And these are board questions oftentimes you'll get, you know, someone's on so-and-so, what labs you wanna check. Potassium citrate, obviously creatinine and potassium. Uh, and then AHA, you want to check for um, CBC because it can cause anemia. As well, um, this is just the different types. So there's electrohydraulic type, which is uses a spark gap to cause a focus. Um, wave of energy that causes the kidney stone to break. It has the widest focal zone um, and the lowest peak pressures. Um, the electromagnet um, basically causes a, mag uh, a membrane to oscillate back and forth, which causes the pulse pressure to be um, uh, directed to where the stone is. It the has the narrowest focal zone to cause stone breakage and it has the highest peak pressures. And then the uh, piezoelectric is basically um, has the nearest uh, focal zones of all of this and has high peak pressures as well. Um, and then when looking at predictors for as well success, thinner patients do better. The less dense the stone is on, on CT scan by using Hounsfield units as a marker, the more likely you are to break it the rougher it is appearing on the x-ray. And if the stone's less than eight millimeters and it's a single stone, it has a much better of uh, likelihood of passing. And non-lower pole stones really are the best uh, option for these, uh, for these patients. And then this again is just a nice little schematic. If you got, you'll want the PowerPoint, right? I'm assuming you will. That would yeah. be great. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just have you look at that. Then AUA guidelines, so this is kind of uh, dense and the AUA website on the guidelines, actually, I find it easier to read than Campbell's, um, but maybe just because I'm old. Uh, the It has a nice overview of each step and what you recommend. And I think this is just common knowledge that we should have when it comes to managing kidney stones. So the first is just looking at preoperative and what imaging needs to be done for patients with kidney stones. So if you're gonna bring a patient to the OR, 
you bring out, get a CAT scan. I think it's absolutely necessary. Um, and then whether or not you needed a functional imaging study, I don't know how that important that is. I think that's more important if you're thinking of removing a patient. Say you have to see a patient with a huge staghorn calculus and you're, you don't see much parenchyma, it's, it's a good idea to document that that kidney has no function prior to removing the, um, the stone or, or the kidney in that, in that case. Um, and then always get a UA and urine culture prior as well as lab work, okay? And then you can, I've done for several patients, if you get a CT that makes this, the stone looks like it's in a, in a diverticulum or, or a weird position, then there's no harm in doing a, um, or even if you can tell that there's a duplicated system, but you can't see if it's completely duplicated or partially duplicated, I think it makes good sense to get a CT urogram to help delineate the anatomy so you know exactly what, what your, your plan in the OR will be. Um, Jim? Yeah. Let's say you have a patient, you got, you know, you one of those consults we get all the time, comes in with a stone, the stone is at, like I said, a UPJ, and um, you send them home and they come back two or three weeks later for intervention with no passage of stone. Do you get an updated CT when, on all your patients to see if the stone has traveled or things are disordered? Do you just use the one that's been? So that's a good question. So did you say UBJ or UPJ? UP as in Paul, UPJ. Um, and so anyone with a distal ureteral stone, if they're asymptomatic and they've not passed the stone, then they need to have some sort of imaging. Most people would say if they're asymptomatic and they, and they haven't <clears throat> seen a stone pass, then you should get a, an, a low dose CT scan because that's going to have the highest accuracy. But you got to weigh that with, you know, younger patients and the risk, particularly women and the risk for malignancy. So I'll use that initial CT scan as a marker. And the first thing you want to look at is the scout film to see if you can see the stone on KUB. And if you can, then that's your marker. And then the other thing you want to look for is hydronephrosis or any uh, mild, even if there's fullness of the collecting system, because then a, uh, an ultrasound will be useful. So for most patients, you're able to get away with like a KUB and a sonogram. Um, but if they're older, I, I don't worry about the radiation dose as much, so I'll just get a CT scan. The problem is, is Sometimes CT scans for these, when they get distal and they get, and it's not a, a high quality, high, higher dose CT scan, sometimes fleboliths start looking like um, kidney stones and it's kind of hard to differentiate. So, you know, sometimes if someone, if you think, in my practice, I've been burned a couple times where I didn't think there was a stone there and I thought it was just a fleboliths as did the radiologist, and then they ended up coming in the ED with, you know, passing a stone. So I think when in doubt, it makes sense to just, at least you could recommend your ureteroscopy, um, or at least document that you've discussed it, and if they would defer it, that's fine. And, th and then when they pass that stone, you'll say, well, you know, we, we thought this could be the case, and, and now that's happened. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, thank you. Um, let's see this, and you know, this, I don't want to waste our time too much with this because I'd rather just power through the questions. So, and a lot of these, these, um, uh, points are brought in the SASP questions. So, um, I'm just, and it's 520. So we can go back if we have time, but I'd rather just do questions. Are you guys okay with that? Yep. Okay. Uh, let me just see if there's any key points here. Basically, don't pre-stent people. Obviously, give medicines for stent bother. Um, I think alpha blockers work. And I also think counseling patients with um, taking scheduled anti-inflammatories after the stents help. So I'll have them take, you know, six to 800 milligrams of Motrin with meals for the first three days, three to four days after the um after the ureteroscopy to help with the stent bother, as well as um, Flomax or Tamsulosin. And then for some patients, who, which tend to be younger men or, or younger women with a lot of 
um, frequency or urgency, then I'll give them uh, five milligrams of oxybut um, TID as needed. And then peridium as well. Um, we already went over this with the graphic there. Uh, you know, for when you do a PCNL, always make sure you have the flexile nef nephroscope because you want to look for every different calyx because you're there. And if you find like a one centimeter stone, you can get it out. And oftentimes stones during um, uh, nephroscopy, when you're doing it with the rigid, um, they can kind of get blown into different parts of the calyx. So you really make sure you always do it, use a flex, flexible cystoscope at the end of the case to make sure you can look in all the parts of the kidney. Um, any other things here from the PCL? Uh, Peed stuff, um, pregnant patients. So here always have OBGYNs involved. Um, these are kind of the most annoying patients to deal with when we're on, on console. We all have dealt with them. Um, I, ideally, you don't do anything. Uh, if you have to do something, then the question is, do you treat them? Do you stent them? Or you do, do you put a nephrostomy tube in? Um, and, you know, I don't think there's a great answer for, you know, there's not a, it's not a, it, it kind of varies by patient. I personally think a nephrostomy tube is probably the easiest way to manage in someone who's symptomatic because um, you can do it quickly. You can, particularly if there's hydronephrosis, and I think patients tolerate it a lot better. Um, I've just seen too many patients where we stent people uh, and they have such bad frequency and urgency that they, it, it just causes, it causes so much, so many phone calls and so many concerns about urine cultures being falsely positive, all this stuff. So I just, you know, and maybe I'm biased because of my IR um, component, but I think nephrostomy tubes are a little bit better. I don't know. What do you guys think? I totally agree with you. Yeah, it, it, it just, I mean, you have to change them more frequently, but, <laughs> but it's just a little bit easier. And then if you are doing... Uh, stent changes in pregnant ladies, you have to um, you have to have OBG involved before because they got to um, do a fetal uh, viability ultrasound before and afterwards, or fetal monitoring before and after the procedure as well. Okay. Does do any other attending stent people more? Or how does it go? I think a few that we managed this year, we managed them with you, so everyone got a nephew. Okay. And we had this lady that attending that was pregnant that, you know, we, we were actively letting her know that she may have less symptoms of like stand border and things of the sort and contractions and stuff that we ended up managing with a PCN. Yeah, I just, I just think it makes, <clears throat> makes more sense. Um, and then here, let's, no, all this stuff is common sense. All right, let's get the questions so you're not here for, all right, so. Who's going to go first? How, who's here? All I see is Brady, who I don't know who that is. John, Elizabeth, uh, John, Ash, and is that it? Uh, there's a bunch of residents in the room. I think Jeff is there. So I'm oh. happy to take the first question. All right. So why don't we do that? So 10 French Neph tube, pound of frog kidney, nephrostogram, six centimeter staghorn. PCNL goes directly in the renal pelvis. Where is the optimal access? <clears throat> so uh, I guess uh, access for PCNLs is always asked about on SASP, and it's always something just to memorize. Uh, I don't think we want to use the existing track because of the angle. Uh, so I would put it, eliminate A, and then let's just see. It's a staghorn calculus, middle anterior, middle posterior, inferior, anterior, inferior, posterior. I guess ideally I would have liked the superior uh, calyx, but I think you want to be posterior. And let's see, follow up staghorn producers directly into the renal pelvis. Yeah, I guess I would go, hmm, 
middle posterior. So he says E. So with the, with the, it's polarity. So that when you have this staghorn, the middle doesn't necessarily let you torque the that nephroscope up and down. So you're going to have a better chance clearing this down if you're a superior upper pole and you're right always posterior. So these answers are either going to be so superior uh, or posterior uh, or inferior posterior. All right. Thanks. Who's next? Do I have to start calling on people? Oh. Good job, Parwiz. <laughs> just kidding. So postmental pencil decreased bone uh, density just develops third calcium oxalate uh, calculus. Um, she has mildly elevated urine calcium, also calcium loading. So she got type one absorbed uh, hypercalcia. The first treatment is hydrochlorothiazide. Okay. Um, how about this one, Parwiz? 36 year old man. <laughs> Chronic T10 spinal cord injury, chronic asymptomatic bacteriuria, unresponsive to antimicrobial therapy. He's managed by CIC, volumes are 400. Systometry demonstrates detrusor A reflexia with high bladder compliance. Renal bladder ultrasound is normal except for a four millimeter calculus in the left renal parenchyma. The best uh, method of management, so basically this guy's got chronic asymptomatic bacteriuria. He's doing CIC probably inefficiently because his volumes are pretty high. Um, he's got a left renal stone that appears to be asymptomatic. Um, you know, I would say if he, was, if he was symptomatic, that's one thing, but I think in this case, it's just a four millimeter stone. There's nothing you really need to do with it. I would say A, reassurance. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, you bring up the whole point of the, um, his, he's got high volumes. The other thing is, is when it says left renal parenchyma, oftentimes these small calcifications in the, in, on the CT, you can have a good sense of if it's going to be in the kidney or in the collecting system. And, you know, ki kidneys, particularly as we get older, do get little calcifications in them. And just because you have a calcification in your kidney doesn't mean it's a kidney stone. So as long as it's less than, you know, three or four millimeters, I oftentimes don't even, you can follow them every year with a KUB if you want, but there's not much you need to do with that. If you had, so far as if you had a, a guy, healthy guy my age, lower pole, eight millimeter stone, well, how would you, asymptomatic, how would you manage that? So, I mean, if it's, if it's asymptomatic, you can observe it. Um, you know, if you start getting symptomatic, um, then we could consider ureteroscopy. Um, but otherwise, I mean, if it's just chilling in the lower pole, not causing any problems, we'll just, you know, periodically monitor it with, with imaging. Okay, and if it's if it's me and I'm saying, when should I see you again, Doc? Uh, you know, if we just had recent imaging, you know, if you got a CT, then I would probably opt for like an ultrasound on your next uh, set of images. Uh, you know, maybe six months to a year, just to evaluate if it's growing or not. Yeah, I think that's how I would do. And then, what if I said I was going to go to? Uh, I'm quitting. I'm quitting uh, medicine. I'm going to go back to school to be a pilot. Yeah, so there, there are certain um, uh, occupations where you're kind of obligated to treat the stone. Um, in which case, if you're a pilot, if you're already a pilot, you know, I would, I would ground you until we treat the stone. Okay. Just because of the risk. What other people do you, do you treat stones uh, with? Um, I know pilots, the pilot is the, the, the classic example. Um, anybody with some kind of obligate, important job that other people's lives are at risk, I think is a good, good rule of thumb, so. So if you get a kidney stone, we're gonna have to treat yours then. Yeah, exactly. Who's no, gonna, take, who's gonna take call, you know? Except <laughs> him operating puts patients' lives at risk. <laughs> I, I, I volunteer for Parvis, I'll do his case. 
go through this case. Okay, perfect. Um, so the the one thing though is how what about a patient a pregnant patient who comes in and or sorry let me rephrase that a woman who's you know she saw Kashanian or her husband saw Kashanian and and they're now going to start trying to have kids but she has kidney stones how are you going to counsel her? Um, and she and she had one kidney stone when she was in college and it was horrible it was the worst experience of her life. You know, so, the, yeah, so it's, I'm it's asking you more real life questions, but I think it's help, it's good to know. Yeah, so you can, so I guess, hold up, so what was the question exactly, sorry? So you have a woman who has a history of kidney stones, has several kidney stones on her kidney on ultrasound, and she has, um, she wants to get pregnant. Okay. And so he had a, and she's had one kidney stone episode where she had to have a stent and it was the worst experience of her life. Yeah, I mean, so the the there's like counteracting physiologic changes during pregnancy. So I think the risk of forming stones is not increased overall during pregnancy. Right. Obviously she's had stones in the past, you know, she's got that basal risk level. And you know that's it's poten it may potentially come up during the pregnancy. She has a potential of getting an obstruction, a potential of getting obstructive pyelonephritis, which could be fatal to the child. But you know, as far as her risk is, it, there's no net increase in the risk. Um, and then pregnant women in general, I think, have a easier time passing stones. So if, you know, there's a, she's got the risk. It may not be as bad, um, and there are certainly. Um, some negative aspects if she does develop an infection. Right. I think the key thing here is you reassure her that, you know, like you said, she's pregnancy increases. Um, lots of things are going on with her. And so she actually probably, there's not an increased risk of her forming a stone. Um, and then if she does pass a stone, she, she will, like, she has a high chance of passing it. The one thing that I look at is kind of a size so if she has a couple stones that are eight millimeters in size on both kidneys or on one kidney, I actually recommend treating those more like prophylaxis just to make sure that she's like cleared out, her, her system's cleared out because, you know, if she's trying to pass an eight millimeter or one centimeter stone in a pregnant lady is, is can be challenging and require an nephrostomy tube. Um, if she doesn't, if they're really trying to avoid any, um, experience where they might have an ephrostomy tube or a um, stent. So that's how I counsel those patients. All right, who's next? Ah, shit. I can't call on you guys. Um, we're in. I wish you guys were in the room. All right, so sorry, I'm having technical issues. So the yeah, what the urine sample that should be collected for pH to establish the diagnosis of RTA fasting. All right, so you need fasting. If you if you don't have fasting um, urine, then you can't actually figure out if you're having the inability to acidify the urine, all right? Did you guys see the answer to this one? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you give it a, let's see how good your memory is. What's the answer? Uh, I will go sense. with D. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> no. I will go with D. <laughs> <laughs> All right, matrix. So other inhibitors, um, a lot of it's just intra, you know, like anatomy is, is the main thing, but main inhibitors are citrate, citrate magnesium, bicucan, glycosamal, I can't pronounce it, osteopontin. 
all right? Uh, someone in Brady, want to answer this? Or can they not talk? Ash, can you? Um, factor most responsible for ureteral dilation during pregnancy. Um, I think I would go with B. No. Okay. Hey. I mean, there's lots of various things, but pregnancies and what side is usually hydronephrotic? Mm. Not sure. Left the side. Right, the right side. So right when you're side. right side. So when you're when you're seeing consults for and you get asked about a, um, a pregnant woman with hydronephrosis and concern for uh, a ureteral stone, what's one other? So you get the sonogram. What's obviously you want to look for the presence of a stone. You want to look for the presence of hydronephrosis. What's one other thing that 90% of the time they never look at in, in the bladder here. Ureteral jets. Yeah, ureteral jets, exactly. All right, PCNL collecting system is perforated, first sign of extrav into the peritoneal cavity, which would mean you're real, I mean, I can't imagine that actually happening, but what, what would it be? Quincy. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I, can I steal this one? Can I steal this one? Yeah, you, you can do yeah. it. Yeah, go ahead. You can call a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it will be hypercarbia. And truly abdominal distension with a PCNL, I think is a little bit much, but I think that's maybe what they're going for. Yo, let me, let, me, let me jump in. Let me jump like, in and get this one for you, Quincy. <laughs> so what ends up happening here is just classic physiology. You get leakage into the retroperitoneum, and basically it pushes on the IVC, so you get a narrow pulse pressure. And then from the pulse pressure, it screws up the ventilation, so you do get hypercarbia later on. Uh, but the first thing is the narrow pulse pressure. So when you're doing a PCNL and the anesthesiologist like says something, you, you know, you just ask him what the difference is between you know, the pressures. Nice. All right. So we'll have Quincy do the next one. So actually, this is too easy. Uh, give this one back. Give this to um, who's a first year there or second year? Anyone? They, they forgot an option, though. It's par was touching the patient. <laughs> That's true. Actually, Rand was also on that case. He was the only one listed on the op note. So, uh, you were never there. Sepsis after PCNL. Anyone? Jonathan. Sepsis after PCNL best correlates with stone culture. Yeah, exactly. Condition associated with uric acid stone formation. Anyone? I'll go with A. Resistance. Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a big thing. RTA, pro, RTA would be what type of stone? Uh, phosphate. Yeah, calcium phosphate. Yeah. But needs, but not proximal, right? It's distal. Right. Uh, I pardon. We trust you in that for sure. Idiopathic calcium oxalate stone formers, Randall's plaques originate. A again? Yeah, basement membranes thin leaves so heavily. Asymptomatic 65 uh, kilogram man, CM creatinine 2, recurrent calculi, urinary creatinine measurement is 0.5. The findings most consistent with. Rand. One second, I gotta read again.
A incomplete collection. I would have found a friend and said A too. Yeah. So basically, for uh, you, questions like this, they're just asking for for to see how, how accurate that twenty four hour urine urine uh, collection was. Pregnant lady, you read all calculus, failed observation, can't tolerate a stent. What do you want to do? Parwas wants to do a lap ureterolithotomy. <laughs> so remember the guidelines that said you could you could do laser lithotripsy, right? Yeah. So th that's a situation. You know, has has anyone here done that? Because I've never actually seen that in practice. Yeah, we we've done we've done a couple. Of, I've done I've scrubbed it on two of those with pregnant um, ladies. Yeah. Yeah, I've done I've done one too. Yeah, What's I that? mean it's pretty it's you know there you get the you get the guy and doctors they put the patient on the um the the monitor the baby monitor and uh you know it's pretty like all my experiences with this have been pretty friendly those ureters are like giant you still have to stent them though at the end of the case for um, what like a couple yeah so i mean in this case it's like she can't tolerate a stent but you know it's hard to do how could you do a laser lithotripsy on a ureteral stone and not leave something at the end of the case? Generally, it gets pretty mucked up. That makes sense. Calcium reabsorption induced by parathyroid hormone and vitamin D occurs primarily through. D? Yes. Who is that? Spiros. Oh, nice. So parathyroid and vitamin D occurs in the distal tubule. Okay. How do you remember that? Or you just know it? Uh, I know calcium at the proximal, like the, the kidney works in the proximal and the hormones works in the distal. Work in the distal. Exactly. Uh, my answer, I think, is showing fact that promotes stone formation during pregnancy absorptive hypercalciuria. And this is what we were talking about before. So the placenta produces this chemical, which is increases calcium absorption, secondary suppresses the parathyroid hormone, but the, so you get increased absorptive hypercalciuria, but you have increased excretion of inhibitors of stone, stone formation. And because of that, that's why you have the, um, no change in stone formation during pregnancy. Okay. Recurrent calcium oxalate stone, oxalate restricted diet, his urinary oxalate is high. Next step, Quincy, unless you want to call Parwiz. Hydrochlorothiazide. Redoxine. That if it's for hydrochlorothiazide, it's better for calcium stones, right? Yep. And you're worried about the oxalate there. 52 year old woman, acute onset of right flank pain, long hand history of diarrhea, laxative abuse, UA, RVC, pH 6.5. She passes stone to stone. What's the most likely composition? So do you think it's struvite, Jonathan? Or Rand, Rand's not answering questions. Yeah, go for Rand. Yeah, Rand, what, what do you think? Uh, it's not struvite. Right, because um, what's, what's struvite associated with? Uh, infections. Right. Um, probably not calcium phosphate, because laxative abuse makes you metabolic alkalosis, I believe. Um, so not xanthine. Uh, I'm going to go with ammonium acid urate. All right. Nice. Good job. Uh, what other key things for that? We went over all the other stuff. 75-year-old uh, peptic ulcer disease, gout, two-centimeter radio opaque renal calculus, hypercalcemia, E. coli, UTI. 
three centimeter primary lung tumor. Most likely cause of his urethra. Or his stone is what? The, honestly, it's kind of a silly question. So what what is lung cancer known for? Parathyroid-related peptide. So ectopic hyperparathyroidism from that perspective. Uh, Powers, why, why don't you go for this? So it's a 20-year-old man, cystinuria, recurrent calculi despite dietary therapy and hydration. The next step is, so he's got cystinuria, um, it's acetohydroxamic acid, them e and acetylcysteine, deep and salumine. So I know these things are supposed to, you, you, you go for the things that break up the, um, the, the, the phosphate. So you can use penicillamine, you can use alpha, recapto, propion, whatever, thiola, thiola. But. Still need an answer. I mean, I think, I think it's, dude, it's either D or E. I think it's E. E or D? E, he is an elephant. Right. Yeah. Hydration, alkali therapy, potassium citrate, oftentimes they'll use initially. Um, and then you can do the thiol. Yeah. What are the side effects of the D penicillamine? Ooh. You, I, I've seen this question before. I, I, I actually don't know off the top of my head. Anyone else? Stomach pain, decreased sense of taste. Thanks, Ron, for Googling. <laughs> 100%, you cheater. I, you can't see you guys. You're probably all Googling. All right. Um, so, Tim, one question. Uh, if you have, like, patients with this weird type of stones, do you follow up with them or you send them to, like, nephrology? I mean, so my practice is so kind of busy with other stuff. I, I tend to st send the recurrent stone from formers to um, – or these weird stones to nephrology. Um, you know, every practice is different. I think if you are, you know, if you if you're only doing stones, then I think it behooves you to to keep management. I mean, the medical management of kidney stones is pretty straightforward. You know, there's there's not much to it. So I think if you have the bandwidth to to have a practice where you're doing that, then that's fine. Um, the like Bodo Knudsen, who is our, was a stone guy at Ohio State, he was so busy, you know, he'd do like eight ureteroscopies a week with, you know, three or four PCNLs a week. So he was super busy operatively. So he didn't have time to, to like be managing the, the um, medical management from it. So they actually had a nephrologist come in on his clinic days and she would see the medical aspects of the stones and he would just see like the immediate post-ops or pre-surgery people or do stent pulls. So it's kind of how you do, build your, your practice. Um, I think anytime you start dealing with something you feel uncomfortable with or, or you think that things might be slipping through the cracks and send it to a referrer. Cause you know, the nephrologists don't mind managing these patients either cause they're fairly straightforward, you know? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I don't, do you, are you guys want to keep through? Are you guys good, or do you want to keep going through this till six? It's up to you. It's a little harder with you guys not on. I'm realizing I have to change the, the schematics because you're you, you're just you're all hiding in in um, the Zoom land. Let's do this last. Let's do this last question, and then we can call it. All yeah, right. this go, this goes to round. All right, what, Grant, go for it. <laughs> I like how I went to 50% of them, but 35 from the end is true. Oh, no, we got to go to Quincy. You're right. I forgot about Quincy. <laughs> <laughs> All 
35 year old man, he's your left renal colon, five months later, calculus in left renal pelvis. Two months later, complains of a burning sensation in the distal urethra, normal urinary stream, no associated bladder symptoms, clinical history, calculus is most likely located in a upper ureter, mid ureter, intramural ureter, bladder, urethra. Um, but likely E because he's no because he's got uh I would probably say B mid ureter. I'm gonna go with C. Yeah. Mm. D. So like the symptomatology of patients will change obviously. So it starts in the flank, then it comes over to the groin. Uh, or sorry, to, to the like right or left lower quadrant. Then it can radiate to the groin or the labia or the scrotum. And then right when it's in the bladder, people will start saying they have lots of frequency or urgency or um, urethral discomfort um, or penile pain. So uh, this is a good point too, just to highlight the need that you have to, if you see a patient with a stone who's in the process of passing it, you have to document somehow with some imaging that they have passed it and, and it is gone. Um, and I think it's also important uh, if they have not passed the stone, you, you got to document that there's no swelling, there's no hydronephrosis, there's no perinephric stranding, um, and the stone's gone it, um, afterwards, okay? Um, yeah, we still... Quick, quick thing that the intramural in that question is uh, basically at the, the level of the bladder, right? That's what they mean in terms yeah. of intramural. Not like as in like embedded in the wall of the urine. No, no, no. It means it's like, it's like, it, it's their funny way of saying intravesical junction. The UBJ okay. is what they should have said. Okay. I'm trying to think if there is any other questions that I saw that I mean they start repeating themselves and we've kind of gone over them all I think the other thing is I feel like on. one of the, one of yeah. the high yield questions um, is always the PCNL in the bowel injury or the duodenal injury when do you pull it out and leave a like a colonic tube when do you like x slap them things like that yes I think if if I remember those correct, correctly, if they're septic, then you have to be super aggressive with the X lap and the colostomy and all that stuff. Um, if there's no signs of sepsis, then you can manage it like a cecostomy tube and a stent. So um, I, and I think if you notice it during a procedure and the patient's stable, then what you would want to do is place a stent and then leave a cecostomy tube. Um, and that's honestly kind of why, you know, when we do the, if you guys have done PCNLs with me, you know, at the very end, we pull, as we're pulling the tube out, we're looking in the tract. Right. One of the reasons why we're doing that is to make sure there's no stones that have like fallen into the um, kind of behind where the sheath is. But the other reason we're looking is we're also making sure there's no, like we haven't inadvertently gone through the colon, right? Because if we do find ourselves in the colon, we'll obviously consult general surgery, but we'll put it, we'll put a tube in there too. You know what I mean? Right. And, um, and, and, and then they would have already been stented. Um, other question I can think about the PCNLs that sometimes come up is do you have to put a tube in or not? And, you know, you really don't need to. And a lot of places, particularly, I think younger people who've trained don't leave nephrostomy tubes in. Um, I, I, is that true at, at um, Brooklyn? Isn't there a new stone guy there? Doesn't he doesn't leave too? Does he? No one's here who's been there. Jonathan, where? Brooklyn Methodist. Oh, oh, oh! Uh, no, the guy there does sometimes tubeless also. Yeah. So, all right. Um. I'll, who did I give this to? Rand Spiros. You can e email it to me, and I'll send it out to everybody. Okay, it might be a little big, but all right. Thanks. Oh, that's awesome. We can, we can come put it on the drive. Come on, it was great. Was Any other yeah. questions? It's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, especially Jim. like all the all the SAS kind of guided questions. I think we should try to like 
incorporate that in every basic science, I think. I mean, because that's what they, I mean, the, it's literally, if you do well on the, on the in-service, you'll do well on the, on the written boards, you know, you won't stress about it. And then the oral boards is just common sense, which is if you've trained at a decent place, you, you won't have a problem passing them. So that, that's the most important thing. Um, and a lot of them, you just, you'll, when you read the questions, you'll learn why the answer is right and you'll understand. The problem is, is like, I can, if you need me to give you a lecture on the medical management and the physiology between renal stuff, let me know, but maybe do it after November. <laughs> Sounds yeah, good. after the service, yeah. All right. Talk to you guys later. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good one.